All right. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, wherever you might be. My name is Josh McCullough. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Health and Safety, Bringing People Back to Work During a Pandemic. Um, we've got a full hour of great information and a great presenter, and I'll turn it over to Kara here in just a second. We're going to do general housekeeping items, pretty standard stuff here. You will receive a copy of the slides that you'll see today, as well as a recorded version of the webinar. Give us about 24 hours to get that to your inbox, but keep an eye out for that. We're going to take a break about halfway through today and do a couple very quick polls and we would love to hear from you in those polls. We'll share the feedback with you. We hope those are a little bit of, of added insight uh, today. Um, this event does meet SHRM and HRCI requirements, recertification uh, requirements uh, for self-submission. Uh, so basically we'll send you the slides. There's a process um, that you can go out to those portals and self-submit for the recertification credits. And uh, we also have a post webinar survey at the end of today's webinar. When you exit Zoom, there will be a survey that pops up. Uh, it'll take you less than 30 seconds. It's really just to hear back, hey, did we, did we hit the mark with this? Was it helpful? Do you have ideas of future topics you'd like to learn about? Things like that. So we appreciate your participation in that survey as well. All righty, with that, I will go ahead and introduce today's presenter. So Kara Govro, if you've been with us in our webinars before, you may have heard Kara before. Uh, she is a labor and employment law attorney, a compliance expert, and has been really covering all things COVID-19 related and has a great hour of content on the uh, health and safety side of bringing people back to work. I did have one other point we have a, a large audience with us today, so we can't make any guarantees on the ability to answer live Q&A. Um, but we do encourage you, submit your questions, and depending on uh, what that flow looks like, we will try our best to pick off a few of those and potentially leave a few minutes at the end. So if you do have questions, please use the Q&A box, not the Zoom chat window. All right, with that, I will turn this over to Kara. Okay. Welcome everyone. It is good to be with you. Um, I'm glad it's Thursday. <laughs> We're reaching the end of our week here. Uh, but before we do, let's talk about making the workplace safe in light of COVID-19. We're definitely not post-COVID. We're sort of mid-COVID. Uh, depending on your take on this, we're either in the first wave or approaching the second wave. Um, but we still have lots to think about, uh, probably for the foreseeable future. So we're gonna spend uh, the bulk of the next hour talking about making the workplace safe, uh, managing individual employee health, how to deal with a diagnosis, and then uh, I've got some, some info on sick leave policies and emergency paid sick leave through the Family's First Coronavirus Response Act. Um, so that, that will, will be what we close with. Let's talk about workplace safety first. So uh, just to put it out there, I'm not an epidemiologist, I'm an attorney. <laughs> um, I don't have all the answers, but I try to keep up with what the CDC is saying. Uh, so what's included here is sort of a combination of CDC recommendations um, as well as, as my own personal thoughts. Uh, a lot of this could change, um, but a lot of it is also just common sense. So my first suggestion for you as an employer to keep your workplace safe is to require employees and customers, if you have them, to wear masks. Not popular with everyone, uh, but pretty widely considered a good idea by scientists. Uh, also, it may be required where you are. So this webinar is not going to touch on anything local or state specific. <coughs> Excuse me. My state governor uh, just announced yesterday that our most populous counties are going to have a mask required rule uh, when anyone is out in public going into effect about a week from now. So it's very possible that you live in a location like that. Um, so it's a little bit redundant to say that we want to have employees and customers wear a mask because they are required to by law. Um, but if that is not the case, then it's certainly your prerogative to require that and it's probably a good idea. 
You should attempt to provide these for employees. Uh, it's certainly much easier to get masks now than it was a couple of months ago. Uh, can you ask them to wear their, their own? Yes, if they say, I don't wanna bring my own from home or I'm saving that for other circumstances or whatever. Um, you really should be requiring this, uh, excuse me, paying for this if you are requiring it, even if you're requiring it because the state said you have to or the county said you have to. Um, there's sort of uh, hard to explain OSHA rules about uh, what you need to pay for if it's required um, as, as any kind of uh, protective garb. Do make a written policy about this. Uh, and intend to enforce it. It's always easier to enforce policies that we've put in writing, it just is. So I would definitely encourage you uh, to make sure that's in writing. All right, um, and if necessary or helpful, this is definitely me and not the CDC, pick a scapegoat for this that you can keep pointing back to. Like I said, not popular with everyone. Um, so if you can say, you know what, the CDC is making us do it. Even if you personally are totally down with it and think it's a great idea, um, if it helps to sort of shift blame, uh, I say go for it. Do whatever makes your work life um, easier. If you're gonna blame it on somebody like the owner or the CEO, do run it by them first. Um, you know, we don't wanna throw anybody under the bus who, who wasn't expecting to be there. All right, there's also personal hand hygiene to think about. So having employees wash their hands as soon as they get into the office or the workplace uh, is a great idea. We have no idea what they have touched before arriving here. Uh, so, you know, once they've sort of come in the front door, that's the right time to get their hands washed. You can also schedule regular hand washing throughout the day. Uh, I think that's just generally a good idea. Uh, you know, even if people aren't touching high touch surfaces, they're just sitting at their desk, they're probably rubbing their eyes um, or their nose or touching their mouth or sneezing or coughing. Um, so, you know, they're, they're touching their own face and, and that's what we wanna wash off, even if it doesn't seem like they're going and touching a bunch of other things uh, regularly. Provide hand sanitizer, uh, sort of around the office, but especially if hand washing is impractical or impossible. So let's say you're a restaurant, you've got you know delivery drivers, um, we wanna make sure that they have hand sanitizer available because they don't have the ability uh, you know, to jump out of the car in the middle of the freeway and, and wash their hands when they feel like they're dirty. Also provide hand sanitizer anywhere somebody can't avoid a touch pad. Um, so this could be where customers are paying um, or it could be where your employees are having to use a touch pad to get into a secured area. So anywhere we can't get rid of a touch pad, uh, I would suggest having hand sanitizer. And you can find hand sanitizer now. I know it was hard to find at first. Um, now it's, it's not difficult to find at all. Um, it's, it's on Amazon, I've checked. It's also in local grocery stores in like two gallon containers. So it's out there. With respect to surface hygiene, we do want to be cleaning more frequently than we were. Uh, you know, some number of months ago, people are pretty comfortable with this, this idea by now. Um, we want to provide disinfecting wipes and make cleaning products like cleaning sprays and paper towels readily available in shared spaces for any employee to use. Uh, that's not required by the CDC. That's me saying this is a good idea. If somebody feels compelled to wash that fridge door handle before they touch it, uh, we certainly don't want to discourage that. We'd like to encourage that, in fact. Uh, Scheduled cleaning of frequently touched services is also a really good idea. Uh, don't assume that people will do that out of the goodness of their heart. Make sure it's actually somebody's job. I know that certain disinfecting agents are still quite difficult to find in grocery stores in the usual places, in which case you can check out the EPA's list of products that kill SARS-CoV-2, the more specific name of this virus. Um, if you search COVID list N, that will come right up for you. And it's, I don't know, 15 pages long. It's a very long list. And it's got some interesting stuff on there like pet cleaners, you know, pet urine removers and, you know, whatnot. So um, stuff that you can probably find more readily than, you know, Lysol uh, is, is on that list. So you may wanna check that out if you've, if you've had any trouble finding cleaning products. 
With respect to surface hygiene, we also really want to reduce touch points if we can. And, you know, as I sort of said at the start, we're kind of in this for the long haul right now. Um, you know, until there's a vaccine, which is probably still at least a year away, uh, we're going to be dealing with these issues. So, and, and even after a vaccine, I suspect uh, the world is going to approach uh, the spread of disease a little bit differently. So I do think it's a good time to just go ahead and invest uh, in some things that will reduce touch points. Um, so they're not all free, they're not all cheap, uh, but some are. So uh, if there are doors in your workplace that can just be open all the time, uh, get door stops. That's, you know, you can wad up some paper and make a door stop. So that one's, that's, well, that's borderline free right there. Um, and there may be doors that people are having to open on a regular basis that just don't need to be closed. Uh, there are also these foot pulls that you can install on, like, for instance, bathroom doors. So if somebody needs to open the door in their own direction, uh, which is usually the case uh, when you're inside a bathroom, you can just step on the little pull on the bottom of the door and pull the door toward you. Uh, so those are kind of cool. Um, I've seen them a few places. I'm actually surprised they're not more, more popular. Um, but those are relatively inexpensive and very easy to install. But you can also look at getting things that are motion activated, uh, motion activated water faucets, soap dispensers, uh, motion activated water fountains or bottle, bottle filling stations. Um, I suspect these are a bit of an investment, but they're pretty cool. Um, and uh, if, if you've ever seen them, it's like you put your water bottle under it and it's motion activated and it fills your water bottle. So you don't have to touch a button because that water cooler button in your building uh, gets touched probably more than just about anything else. And then if you do have pin pads, like we were talking about earlier, if you can replace those with something uh, where employees can just swipe uh, a key fob, you know, a little access card instead of touching a pin pad, uh, that's, that, that would probably be a good investment at this point as well. Let's talk about some modifications for spaces that are open to the public. And these are both sort of uh, structural changes as well as um, administrative or, or business operation changes. So we do want to stagger customer flow. That's probably required uh, depending on where you live. There's, I, I don't know that anyone has reopened without at least uh, reducing the number of customers that can be in a location. So presumably you are subject to that. You can mark the floor with directional arrows to get people to move uh, in only one direction. I think over the last couple of months, we've all gotten a little bit better at that <laughs> in the grocery store. Uh, you can of course remove furniture to reduce capacity and create distance. Um, as well as install blockades, like, you know, create dead ends where one did not exist before, as long as people can see the dead end. Um, that way they won't use that aisle or that space just to get from point A to point B. Uh, you can potentially reduce congestion that way. And then if you can set up a touchless pay system to help customers figure out uh, how to, how to pay without touching your, your pin pad, that would be awesome. Um, I know I was at the grocery store a while back and the, uh, somebody was manning the U-scan and, you know, she was cleaning the surface where you put your groceries and where you put your bag, which nobody was touching, but they weren't cleaning the pin pad every time um, or at all. And that didn't make a lot of sense. So <laughs> to the extent you can set up touchless pay, uh, do it. That would be awesome. Uh, and provide hand sanitizer at the door or again, anywhere where people do have to touch a pin pad and can't avoid it or a door handle and can't avoid it. As for modifications to office spaces, uh, one of the primary modifications you can make is to your ventilation systems. So upgrade to HEPA filters. If you don't have them already, you could look at uh, you know, UV light systems. Uh, if airflow can be manipulated, have it move from clean areas to less clean areas. Change seating arrangements. So send people to empty desks and conference rooms, break rooms, unused offices, lobbies, courtyards. If you're in somewhere with nice weather and the Wi-Fi reaches outside, by all means, let people work out there or encourage them to work out there. 
Um, and if you can't spread people out well enough, do install barriers like plexiglass uh, or plywood or cardboard. I, I assume plexiglass manufacturers um, are ready for you and have relatively quick turnarounds at this point because they've probably beefed up. I can't say that for sure. If you can't find plexiglass, you can do other things. Um, we've had a couple people ask if the slides were, will be distributed and they will. So you'll get a copy of the entire PDF presentation as well as a recording of the whole webinar. Um, so these slides do have a lot of information on them and that's not really going to stop. <laughs> Some of my final slides are very wordy. You will have access to this later um, sort of as a reference document. So uh, don't worry about taking copious notes right now or anything. Okay, other modifications to office spaces. Uh, well, really one of the biggest and best things we can do is to allow people to work from home. Uh, even if you can allow people to work from home part-time instead of full-time, um, that is, is better than trying to get everybody in the office at the same time. One of you actually uh, asked a question. You said, we have an employee with chronic health issues who doesn't want to come back in when all of our other employees have returned. Um, and we do have safety measures in place, but it seems like this employee's sales production are down working from home and we feel like it would be better if he came back to the office, basically, you know, what do we do about this? Um, that's a really great question. Uh, working from home should be encouraged, even if people are not doing quite as well at it. It's like, separating people is our best defense against this virus. So that is, is certainly recommended. Um, and I'm going to come back to this a little bit more when we talk about reasonable accommodations. If you can stagger shifts, that's another approach we can take. Um, like, you know, if, if you're an office environment and, you know, people need to do this work, but they don't necessarily need to do it between eight and five, uh, you can spread your hours out. Um, if you do have hourly employees, you can change their shifts. If not everybody is hourly, you've got some exempt employees, you can certainly um, sort of establish shifts for them in the meantime. Um, you know, it doesn't mean we're going to dock their pay if, if, you know, they don't do all their hours. We're still going to treat them like an exempt employee, but we could say, hey, we want you to come in a couple hours earlier and leave a couple hours earlier um, or come in a few hours late. If you are going to adjust schedules or just open up schedules, I, I would recommend assigning hours um, at least to a certain degree because, for instance, if you just say, okay, the office is going to be open from 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. so people can spread out, it's possible that people just won't spread out. <laughs> They'll still come in between eight and five or that everyone will want to come in, you know, two hours early. My best modification for meetings suggestion is to have them online. Um, and there are a lot of options out there. So uh, this is just a short list of available options that are free. So you can get people uh, together on the internet for free, um, and that is highly recommended. Um, again, I, these are in alphabetical order, you'll notice. I am not uh, <laughs> suggesting that you should purchase any of these in particular. I just wanted you to see that there are quite a few options. If you absolutely must have an in-person meeting, then I would follow uh, sort of these guidelines. Have it in the biggest space available to you and make sure that that space is well ventilated. Uh, set up chairs ahead of time that are at least six feet apart. Don't have people bring their own chairs and expect them to do this well. They won't. <laughs> they won't. They won't do it right. Um, even if they do manage to be far apart at the end of the day, they'll probably pass close one and pass by one another closely in the meantime. So um, help them out. Do it ahead of time. Do make sure you've got obvious wide pathways so people don't have to sort of dance to get past one another. And do find a way to record or simulcast those meetings so that people who can't attend in person still get the benefits and are not excluded. Um, we're going to come back to reasonable accommodations, um, as I already mentioned once before. But for instance, if we have most of our employees back in the office, but a few people are staying home uh, because they are high risk, 
and we're, you know, accommodating them in that way, we do need to make sure that they can fully participate really in the employment experience. And it's just not that hard to, to record meetings. Uh, so do make sure you're doing that. If you have people who are working from home, you're not just saying, oh, you're out of luck because you're not in the office. All right, let's talk about managing individual health. Um, someone just asked, can we require employees to take temperatures before entering the office space? And that is a great segue um, because what I would recommend is having employees self-assess before they even come to work. Um, preferably, we're not going to have people bringing their germy symptomatic selves to the front door uh, to get checked. So have employees um, assess their own health before coming to work in the morning. Are they experiencing any symptoms of COVID-19? Uh, the current short list is actually longer than the list right here. <laughs> I will update it before I send you the slide deck. Um, but the, the list of symptoms for COVID-19 that we sort of acknowledge as being relatively common is pretty long at this point. So it includes cough, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, fever, chills, muscle pain, sore throat, loss of taste or smell. Uh, I think nausea, diarrhea, and headache are on the list as well uh, now. So feel free uh, or encourage people to stay home if they have any of those symptoms. We can also have people check their own temperature at home, um, either perceived or measured. So if they feel hot, have them stay home, even if they don't have a thermometer. Uh, the number that's still in use right now is 100.4 degrees, uh, but you don't, you don't need to let people have a temperature that high if you don't want to, right? Um, you know, a lot of people's regular body temperature is below 98.6. And so 99.5 for me, for instance, would be hot. It would be very weird for me to be 99.5 degrees. So if, if I measured that for myself, I would tell my employer that it wasn't a good idea, good idea for me to come in because by my own standards, that would be a fever. Um, so feel free to err on the side of caution, uh, both with temperatures and with symptoms. With respect to temperature taking, if we want to get the best, most accurate measurement, uh, we want to wait 30 minutes after eating, drinking, or exercising. So if you are having people come to the office and you're doing the temperature taking, there's a decent chance those criteria are met. If you're having people check at home, uh, you may want to pass these on to them as well. If they have a morning workout, they don't want to, you know, take their temperature right afterwards. We also want to wait at least four hours after taking uh, Tylenol, ibuprofen, or aspirin. Obviously, if they're taking these things because they have a fever, then they're going to stay home anyway. But if they're taking ibuprofen because they've got, you know, sore muscles from their long bike ride, uh, then we do want to wait at least four hours before we consider the temperature they've taken to be accurate. If you're taking temperatures, uh, we want to make sure that the person doing that has sufficient personal protective equipment. So, you know, the person who has to interact with every single employee that morning uh, or afternoon, start of whatever shift, um, should be very well protected because they're going to have to get within six feet of people. Uh, so, you know, masks, if they want goggles, if they want a face shield, if they want a gown, if they want gloves, get that person whatever it is they want. Uh, feel free to go overboard. I have not found any specific guidance yet on how to do this um, other than, you know, go over the top with PPE, you know, get a thermometer that doesn't go in somebody's mouth and that they don't have to touch, like in this picture, right? She's got that little thermometer that touches the guy's forehead. Some of them, I think you don't even have to touch the forehead. You just sort of like beam it at the forehead, um, you know, so do as much as you can. Uh, and it's possible that you'll, your local health authority will have some, some specific guidance that you could look for. If you're taking temperatures, that information is confidential. Um, and I have seen that some localities are requiring it and they're requiring you to record the information. Um, so if you're recording it, it needs to be kept like any other medical information. So it should be separate from the employee's personnel file. Um, and we do need to treat it as, as totally confidential. Same deal with symptoms. So uh, we want to keep them specific to COVID-19 if we're going to ask about them. 
like I said, it's a pretty long list right now. Uh, so it may get into territory where, you know, the person says they're coughing, uh, but it's not because of COVID-19, it's because of allergies. Um, but we don't want to ask a totally open-ended question, like, do you have any symptoms or how are you feeling today? Uh, because if the person starts, you know, explaining things that are completely unrelated uh, to any COVID-19 symptoms, then we have gathered medical information that we really didn't need or want. And this information will need to be kept confidential as well, just like the temperatures. Someone asked, should the person wear a gown when conducting temperature checks? Um, I don't think it hurts. I, if, if they want a gown, I would certainly provide it. Uh, there's sort of, you know, <laughs> varying degrees of paranoia. I, I know that medical professionals, I think for the most part are, are wearing gowns. And since that person is sort of functioning as a medical professional for you, um, it, it's certainly, like I said, I, it wouldn't hurt. And if they want it, I would absolutely um, provide it. How much, uh, you know, safety and risk reduction that's actually providing for that individual, assuming they're doing everything else uh, in a really safe measure, I, I, I don't know. Um, but, but again, couldn't hurt. Um, so somebody said, we can't ask, it's the employee's responsibility to tell us they have symptoms, right? So no, that's not the case anymore. Um, generally, pre-COVID, uh, the ADA would say you can't do medical exams on employees, right? You can't take temperatures. You can't ask people coming in in the morning what kind of symptoms they might be having. That would not be allowed in you know, the normal universe we lived in six months ago. But COVID-19 is a direct threat in the workplace. Uh, so that rule goes out the window um, in light of a direct threat. So you can take temperatures and you can ask about symptoms. But like I said, you want to keep it specific to COVID-19. Don't just say, do you have any symptoms? Say, do you have, and rattle off that list of 12 things. Um, that, that would be the recommended approach for that. As for dealing with anxious employees, um, they exist. We've been hearing about them for months. People who we want to come back, uh, you know, we're taking safety precautions, but they're just not comfortable with it. You know, there's only so much we can do. So we're going to talk up what we're doing to keep the workplace safe. We are going to ensure them that we will continue to adapt and that we're open to suggestions. Tell them that you are reading the CDC's guidance on at least a weekly basis to see what has changed and then actually do that. Um, if people want to wear extra PPE, if they want to wear goggles to work and gloves, just let them. Um, if you want them to come back and they're anxious, let them do whatever goofy thing they want to do to feel comfortable in the workplace. Uh, you know, anxiety is like a huge, huge issue uh, in, in the United States, possibly globally, um, but a lot of people suffer from some kind of anxiety disorder and you don't necessarily know about it and you don't need to know about it, but one of the things you can do to help those employees um, is, is basically to let them do what they need to do to, to reduce their own anxiety. And that might be wearing a goofy amount of PPE in your opinion. If employees do not have special circumstances, if they're not high risk, they're just paranoid, uh, we don't need to let them stay home. We can require them to come in. Again, if they're capable of working from home, I would strongly encourage you to allow that, even if they are slightly less productive. Um, but if they can't, you know, you're you're in a customer service environment, you absolutely need them physically in the building, uh, then it, unless there's you know, a reasonable accommodation that needs to be made, you can require those employees to come in. But let's do talk about those reasonable accommodations. So if someone comes to you and they say, I'm high risk, I'm pregnant, I have diabetes, I have heart disease, I have COPD, whatever it may be, um, we need to engage in the interactive process, assuming the ADA applies to us. So the ADA applies at 15 or more employees, and it says you need to make reasonable accommodations for employees with disabilities. Um, and under the circumstances, pretty much anything that makes you high risk for a bad case of COVID-19 is going to be considered a disability. If someone is asking for this, you can require a doctor's note, right? So that's part of the interactive process. If they say, I have to work from home, or I need an extended leave, 
um, because I'm high risk, you can ask for proof of that. You don't have to take their word for it, but you're going to engage in the interactive process and you're going to tell them that that's what, what's happening. You don't have to accommodate someone who lives with someone who's high risk. So the ADA does not extend out that extra degree. You only have to accommodate an employee with a disability, not an employee with a family member with a disability. So if you've got an employee whose wife um, is undergoing chemotherapy and he doesn't want to come in because he doesn't want to you know, take that extra risk home to someone who's immunocompromised, you do not have to provide him uh, a reasonable accommodation. The ADA does not kick in. That said, you should. I'm just going to go out there and say it. You should accommodate that person, um, especially if there's any way that he can work from home. Uh, you don't want it on your conscience that, you know, the only exposure he had was coming to work. They were, you know, having their groceries, groceries delivered and all the rest. Um, and now he's taken COVID-19 home and his wife has died. I mean, th these are things we, we don't want to, to be responsible for. So if you can accommodate, um, please do. Please, please feel, you know, free to, to make those concessions. All right, uh, let's see if we've got a couple questions here uh, that we can take before we have a poll or two. Um, actually, I do see some questions about employees who um, are diagnosed, and we're going to come back to that topic in just a minute. So I'm going to turn it over to Josh for a couple of polls. All right, thank you, Kara. We are going to do a couple of polls here. We'll make quick work of them. I'm going to go ahead and deploy the first one. Question is, how confident are you that you will meet workplace health and safety expectations through COVID-19? And these can be expectations from anywhere, whether it's agency expectations and guidelines, employee expectations, just in general, how are you feeling about your ability to meet the, uh, the new standards during a pandemic? So we are at 50% already. I'm going to let this one go. I do want to answer a couple. I've seen a couple comments about receiving the slides and the recording. Just a reminder, we are definitely going to be sending you a recorded version of the slides uh, or of the, of the uh, webinar, as well as a PDF of today's slides for your records. Um, so those are coming, give us about 24 hours. All right, we are at 64%. I'm gonna close this poll and share the results. Um, hey, good news. Looks like very confidence in the lead. About 50% say very, 50%-ish say somewhat confident. So not too many in the not very confident or not confident at all category. Wherever you sit here, it's great, great to see that you're very confident, um, but wherever you sit, we hope today's webinar can help you get into an even better place. So I will pull that one down. Let's do the second poll here. All right, this question is, to what degree is HR responsible for workplace health and safety practices at your organization? And we understand we may have a lot of SMBs or smaller um, employers who don't necessarily have formal HR departments. Uh, so I guess you could interpret this as to what degree does the person wearing the HR hat also wear the workplace health and safety hat at your organization? Uh, we're at 40%. I'll give it five more seconds. Thank you for your participation. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, 64% again. Let me share the results. Looks like HR is mostly responsible, followed by partially responsible. So in general, what I take from this is it looks like it's not exclusively HR in most cases. Um, it does look like 21% say it's fully HR that uh, looks over the health and safety. Uh, but interesting feedback, you know, health and safety, de depending on your industry and your size, often end up getting siloed into different departments. So that's interesting insight. Thank you so much for participating in that. Uh, I will kick it back over to Kara for the uh, back half of the webinar. All right. Okay, let's talk about dealing with the COVID-19 diagnosis in the workplace. Um, I do want to take a couple of questions, though. So somebody asked about, you know, what do you do with employees who have been traveling to other states uh, when they come back? Well, the entire United States is considered subject to community transmission right now. So you really don't need to do anything special uh, with somebody who has traveled in the United States <laughs> because it's everywhere. Um, you know, there, there are 
as likely to get it uh, traveling as they are in the grocery store or in your workplace, most likely, um, from, from what I've heard, uh, you know, airports are pretty, pretty locked down right now. They're actually not even letting people travel if they have temperatures and whatnot. Um, so I don't think you need to do anything special with employees who have traveled. Um, all people in the United States and probably the globe are encouraged to regular, um, sort of check their own symptoms regularly. Think about whether you are experiencing symptoms. Um, so nothing special, you know, each and every one of us should take it upon ourselves to wake up in the morning and say, do I feel feverish? Do I have any of these symptoms? And if I do, I'm gonna stay home and keep myself away from everybody else. Um, so nothing, nothing particularly special there. Uh, there's another question and we got a lot of this question early on. I used to have a whole slide on it. Um, the question is, what about an employee whose spouse works with someone that has tested positive? Um, so I, I was calling this the nth degree of separation. Uh, so you've got an employee who is exposed to someone who is exposed to someone. Um, and that's uh, just like travel, right? We have community transmission in the entire United States. Almost every single one of us is probably within three degrees of COVID-19, if not two degrees of COVID-19. You know somebody who knows somebody who is exposed to somebody. Um, so uh, you don't need to do anything special for that employee whose spouse was exposed to someone with COVID-19. Once again, everybody should just be sort of doing, you know, thoughtful daily symptom checks on themselves. All right, but what if an employee is in fact diagnosed? Uh, well, other employees should be notified if they had exposure in the workforce. So if all of your people are working from home right now and somebody you know, calls you on Zoom and says, I need uh, you know, some time off because I've got COVID-19 and I feel terrible and I can't possibly work right now, you don't need to go tell all your other employees who are working from home that somebody has COVID-19. Uh, that's not your obligation. Your obligation is to let people know if they were potentially exposed. The catch is you're not going to tell them who's sick. Uh, that is protected health information. It's covered by the ADA. We're not going to share that. Yes, uh, this will feel strange. Employees will not be happy. They will want to know exactly who is sick, um, but it's, it's simply not allowed. We have not made a change to that law yet. <laughs> um, so, you can certainly help employees understand their, uh, you know, level of exposure. Uh, for instance, if someone on the night shift got sick, you could say, you know, somebody on the night shift has been diagnosed with COVID-19. So, you know, your day shift people aren't so worried about it. You are, of course, free to call the CDC or your local health department to get specific information uh, or help deciding uh, whether or not there are employees who should be uh, recommended to quarantine. And I am going to talk a little bit more about that in just a few slides. But I wanted to talk first about when a sick employee can come back. So generally, we really want them to be making this decision with their health care provider. Um, but I wanted to give you a sense of sort of the general rules in play. So right now we are saying that at least 72 hours should have passed since recovery. And that means they don't have a fever without the use of fever reducing medications and they've had improvements in their other symptoms. But also they need to be at least 10 days out uh, from the start of their symptoms. So for instance, let's say somebody has symptoms. Uh, they come into work, they tell you they've got symptoms, you send them home, and they really, truly, honestly feel better two days later. Um, you know, it was a very mild case, perhaps. Uh, so they had two days of sickness. We're going to wait 72 hours, right, since they're, they've resolved uh, their symptoms and their fever. Can they come back? No because we need 10 days from when their symptoms first appeared. So even though they feel better and it's been 72 hours at the day five mark, we're gonna wait till the, the day 10 mark to have that employee come back to the office. Because basically, uh, you know, you stay contagious even after symptoms have resolved. 
Uh, that's it. The number used to be seven days. Uh, they've upped it to 10. I checked again this morning. It's still 10 right now. For all we know, that number could go up or it could go back down. We'll see. Do exposed employees need to quarantine? Um, in most cases, probably not, unless there was close contact for a prolonged period of time. So the CDC is using these terms, but it's not really defining these terms. <laughs> uh, they said they don't have enough data to, to define them, but they're giving sort of a ballpark, which is 15 minutes without social distancing or masks uh, probably counts as close contact for a prolonged period of time. So, you know, if you've uh, got employees uh, working retail and you haven't really been enforcing social distancing and they don't have to wear masks, it's optional. Um, so you've got people, you know, with fairly close contact, then yeah, other people who, who were close to that person for more than 15 minutes without masks should in fact go quarantine um, and not come back for 14 days. Standing together on a factory line is perhaps an even more obvious um, example of when we should have people quarantining. If you're, you know, a large open office environment and you've got people, you know, in their own separate cubicles and someone's, you know, a cubicle or two away uh, and, and maybe the person who was diagnosed was even asymptomatic, that's, that's going to be a non-quarantine situation, not required in that case. You do need to do some disinfecting and some cleaning if you discover that someone has been diagnosed. Uh, you don't necessarily need to close the whole building or shut the whole company down or anything like that. Um, but we do need to clean up the area that was used by that person or visited by a sick customer. Ideally, we wanna shut that area down for 24 hours. Um, if we can't do 24 hours, then we're gonna shut it down for as long as possible. And then we are going to take steps to clean and disinfect that area. So this is pulled right off the CDC's website. Um, these are the highlights. It, these are most of the highlights, but there's even more in-depth information uh, provided by the CDC. And a plug for the CDC, really, um, the stuff they've got out there is pretty darn good. Like, it's written in plain English. They cover a ton of FAQs. Uh, the website is very navigable. So I would certainly encourage you to spend some time there if you've got questions, uh, because they, they cover a lot of stuff, and they, they actually are doing a really good job of it. So we do want to close off the area that was used by the sick person, uh, whether they're an employee or a customer. We want to open outside doors and windows to increase air circulation. Air circulation is big. Again, wait 24 hours if you can. Uh, you know, I think the 24-hour rule is becoming is because we assume that the virus is going to be dead on most surfaces after 24 hours. Uh, you know, it lasts, it lives between days, excuse me, hours, a couple of hours and maybe a couple of days. Um, but I think they've decided that it's, it's almost entirely dead after 24 hours when on a surface. Um, so it's gonna be safer to clean after 24 hours, but that's not always gonna work. If you need to vacuum, there are really specific rules about vacuuming. Um, so you may wanna look into those. Once the area has been disinfected, it can be reopened for use. Uh, workers who didn't have close contact with the person can come right back to work after the area has been, you know, cleaned up or disinfected. And if it's been more than seven days since the sick person was there, we don't need to do anything special. So we're like really, really sure that after seven days, the virus is dead. Um, so we don't need to do any extra cleaning or disinfection if it's been that long since the person was there. Uh, whatever risks were out there, you know, have, have already been out there um, and, and, and have passed. Okay, let's talk about sick leave policies. Uh, there are a few things to think about here. And you may be wondering why we're talking about policies during a you know, health and safety webinar, but the best way to keep your workplace safe is to keep sick employees out of it, full stop. Um, so we need to change our attitude. We need to make our sick leave policy as standard and as well enforced as our attendance policy. So, our attendance policy says you have to be in the office, and if you're not, you're in trouble. 
our sick leave policy says if you're sick you have to not be in the office or not be in the workplace and if you come in you're in trouble <laughs> like I, I know this is weird you know we, we've got a super over the top you know work ethic work when sick kind of culture in the united states um, but we need to change that uh, for the sake of of public health changing attitudes towards absence and towards sickness is fairly easy at the highest levels of, of, of a company or a corporation. Um, it's much harder at the lower levels to sort of actually infuse those feelings into our managers. Uh, managers are often on deadlines. They're, you know, they have production goals. Uh, they need things to get done and they're not necessarily going to follow corporate guidance about letting employees stay home when they don't feel well. So this is going to require some training. It's going to re require some really like blunt conversations uh, that also put managers um, in charge and, and say, you know what, if your people come to work sick and stay at work sick, you're on the hook. Uh, not only are they in trouble for being here and potentially, you know, spreading a fatal illness, but you, manager, who let them stay here or encourage them to stay here, you are also on the hook for this. If you have attendance incentives or uh, for individuals or teams, you know, like there's a piece of party if you know there are no absences for the month or whatever get rid of those uh suspend those for now we really don't want to be encouraging people to come in when they're sick uh just to you know get some party or meet some goal or get some bonus also look at your call out policies uh to make sure they are actually reasonable and workable i have seen so many that are like you have to give us 12 or 24 hours notice to call in sick and that's just not how sickness works so if you've got an employee dragging themselves into the office uh you know because you have a 24-hour call out policy and they don't want to violate the policy well that's that's no good they have now brought their germs um in into the building and you know spread them around at least to some small degree just because they didn't want to violate your call out policy so uh, take a look at that and make sure it's reasonable if you are in a state uh, or a locality with a local sick leave law, there is a very good chance it has been extended in some way or another to cover COVID-19. I mean, generally COVID-19 would be covered by pretty much any sick leave law if the person is actually sick with that. Um, but many local laws have also been extended to uh, caring for children or caring for family members with COVID-19. Um, so do check out your local laws if you're subject to any. We also have our first and maybe only ever uh, national sick leave program. And that came to us under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. It took effect on April 1st, and it provides something called emergency paid sick leave, um, as well as emergency FMLA for childcare. I'm only gonna talk about sick leave today. Um, EFMLA is a whole nother thing. <laughs> Um, but, but today we're talking about workplace safety as it relates to sickness. So EPSL applies to all private employers with fewer than 500 employees. That is probably every single one of you on this webinar or almost every single one of you. So uh, there's no exception for small employers. This is one employee to 499 employees. You have to provide emergency paid sick leave. It's also available to all employees, no matter how long they've been employed. If you hire somebody today and they need EPSL tomorrow, you have to give it to them. Good news though, is you don't pay for this. It's, it's paid for by the federal government. Um, however much you spend on EPSL, you get to take right off the top of your next payroll tax bill. Um, so it's not really coming out of your pocket. And it is in addition to any other PTO or sick leave you already offer. Um, and you can't reduce your current offerings because EPSL now exists. So if you usually offer a week of sick leave, you can't say, oh, we're getting rid of our sick leave program because EPSL covers that. You know, the government's gonna pay for our sick leave program now. You can't do that. You have to keep offering what you offered before. This is just on top of that. 
I am not going to uh, drag you through all the details of the next couple slides, but as we've mentioned a couple times, you're going to get a copy of this deck, um, and this information is available in the HR Support Center. Um, so if you're unfamiliar with EPSL, uh, we have tons of information on that, including uh, this PDF that you're, you're going to get in the next day um, or less. So uh, EPSL can be used when someone's sick, when they're getting a diagnosed, when they're caring for someone who's sick, uh, or when their child's out of school because the school is closed because of COVID-19. Full-time employees are going to get up to 80 hours. Uh, they will get 100% of their regular pay, up to $511 a day, if they're caring for themselves. If they're caring for someone else, they'll get two-thirds or up to $200 a day. And leave can be taken in, on more than one occasion, but it can't exceed 80 hours. So if they want to take in a week now to care for grandma, and three months from now they get sick themselves and want to use their other week of EPSL, that's allowable. What might surprise you about EPSL is that you can't ask for a doctor's note. So we're going to get their name, we're going to get the dates they took leave, we're going to get the reason they took leave, um, we're going to get the name of their doctor that told them to quarantine uh, or stay home, or the name of the government agency that told them to quarantine or stay home, and we're going to have them state that they can't work or telework because of this reason. Uh, there are more details on documentation, although, I mean, this is really all of it for sick leave, uh, but there's also information about uh, documentation for EFMLA available on the HR Support Center. Do consider doing more. So you don't have to do the bare minimum, and, and we would encourage you to go above and beyond um, if at all possible. Like we said, you know, EPSL is actually paid for by the government, um, so Feel free to have your own sick leave policy in addition to that. If you already had one, like I said, you have to keep it. You can't cut it down, um, but now might be the time to consider uh, whether you want to offer even more than you did before. Um, you know, allowing time off for any illness, for instance, if you did not previously have a sick leave program. Limiting the spread of any kind of illness um, and allowing sick people to recover at home is going to reduce risk all around in your workplace and make people feel safer and better about being there. So I kind of cruised through uh, those last few slides on sick leave because you'll be able to check those details out um, for yourself later. And I do see some more questions coming in, which I wanted to leave time for. But before I get to your questions, let me just show you a couple of resources we have available in the HR Support Center. We have tons of stuff. So we've got layoff letters. We've got recall from furlough letters. We've got, um, you know, I think we've got policies for, you know, mask wearing in the workplace. We've got all sorts of stuff in there. So definitely go check it out if you haven't. If you just search COVID-19 or COVID using our search bar, you're gonna get a ton of information. We have so many FAQs. Um, so do go to the HR Support Center and check it out today. Um, one of the items we have is this return to work checklist. So we have sort of uh, compiled the top hits, the things you really need to be thinking about. Um, hopefully this will make employers feel better that they've, they've checked some boxes. Um, so we'll walk you through that. We also have a guide. Um, I actually wrote this on deciding who to recall from furlough or layoff. So I know a lot of companies went out and uh, furloughed you know, huge sections um, of, of their company, maybe everyone, maybe 50% of people, and, you know, as, as business picks back up, they're trying to decide who to bring back, and there are actually a lot of potential discrimination issues in there uh, when you're deciding on, on who to let go entirely um, or who will be returned or who, who will be returned first, so this is a guide to get you sort of thinking about uh, those things and, and discrimination in particular. Okay, um, if you need to take off or want to get your, your five or six minutes back, uh, feel free. Do take our post-webinar survey. If you would, it'll only take a minute. Um, and now I am going to come back over to our questions and see what we've got. Give me just a second to, to look through these. Um, coming back to that travel question, so somebody asked if an employee travels, are they required to self-quarantine upon return? Uh, my answer to that was no. 
uh, they're, they're not. Um, and something to keep in mind is that if you tell them to quarantine, uh, they will not be able to use emergency paid sick leave for that. So they can only use uh, EPSL if they've been told to quarantine by the government specifically, not just general CDC guidance, um, or a healthcare provider has told them to quarantine because they believe the person has COVID-19. Um, so someone who's quarantining just because they traveled and you want them to, or because they're high risk, they want to, you know, use EPSL for the next two weeks, that's, that's not doable, that's not allowed. Uh, someone asked, is it necessary to inform our employees or send them home if someone has been showing symptoms but has not yet been tested positive? Uh, that's a good question, and there is no definitive answer. Um, I would certainly say if someone has the symptoms and they're going to get tested, but for whatever reason, that's going to take a couple of days, I would probably tell employees that yes, someone is out right now with symptoms of COVID-19, please watch your own symptoms carefully. You may have been exposed. That would be my take on that. Um, and certainly a lot of people I think are still not necessarily getting tests. They're just being uh, sort of presumptively diagnosed by healthcare providers. You know, they call up on the phone, they say, I've got these five symptoms. And you know, the advice nurse says, hey, that sounds like COVID to me, you better stay home, you know, and, you know, follow this guidance or whatever. Um, you know, they may not end up getting a test. So if that's the case, if they've been uh, presumed to have COVID-19, you should still go through the, the regular steps that you would um, if someone had had a positive test. Uh, somebody asked, uh, since this virus isn't going away anytime soon, does that mean we should pay uh, the employee who's high risk and can't work from home for the duration of this pandemic? Uh, paying employees who aren't working could substantially hurt a business. So the ADA, uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act that requires reasonable accommodations that I sort of talked about at length, does not require that you pay someone who isn't working you would provide them with an unpaid leave. If they really can't do any work from home, uh, then the ADA would say, give that person an unpaid leave. We can also look at an undue burden, right? So giving someone unpaid leave and basically guaranteeing their job for three years would probably be an undue burden. Right now, we don't exactly know the direction this is going. Um, and that's why we engage in the interactive process. You know, maybe you say to this person, I don't know that we can do an indefinite unpaid leave um, and, and guarantee your job at the end of it. And they say, well, how about this? You know, you're supposed to collaborate and, and work this out together, but you're not required to pay them. If they're not working and they're on an ADA leave, that is not a paid leave. All right, looking for some more questions. We've got plenty. Um, someone asked, should we have employees who worked in close proximity to someone who was diagnosed also get tested? Um, I, I think that's probably a good idea. Um, I wouldn't require them to do it on their own dime if they're not feeling any symptoms. Um, this sort of gets into like, you know, if you send them, okay, so EPSL, emergency paid sick leave, it does cover uh, seeking a diagnosis if you have symptoms, but it doesn't cover just taking time off to get a test because you were exposed. Can you, the employer, decide to pay for that time and pay for that test? Yes, absolutely. It just won't be covered by EPSL. Um, so yeah, having those employees get tested is probably a really good idea. Um, if I were you, I would pay for their time to get tested and I would also pay for the test because they were diagnosed at work. All right, looking for more questions. We've got lots and lots. Um, so I feel like I addressed a lot of these uh, in the presentation. A lot of you were asking about what do we do with an employee who's been diagnosed. So I, I did cover that on a few slides. I would encourage you to go to the CDC's website. Um, they have a lot of information there. 
uh, that is going to be more specific and, and carefully worded than what I can provide you right now. Again, <laughs> I'm an attorney, not a doctor, not an epidemiologist. Uh, so do go check out the CDC resources. I, I really can't stress that enough. We've got a lot of good stuff in the HR Support Center. You should definitely go there too. Um, but uh, the CDC should be your go-to for, for the medical stuff. Also, if someone is diagnosed in your workplace and you're concerned about who's at risk and what to do, call your local health authority, um, you know, the county health department or whatever. My, my feeling is that they are really opening, open to helping employers figure out what the level of risk is, who should be tested, who should be quarantined. So let's rely on our experts for that um, and, and use those resources that are available. Someone asked, uh, this is a good one, this has come up a lot, and I'll make this my last question. Um, are we able to use the federal paid sick leave for stay-at-home orders? That is like the number one question we had for at least two weeks straight <laughs> when, when FFCRA first went into effect on April 1st. So uh, yes and no. If someone is subject to a stay-at-home order but could still work, you still had hours for that person, and they could work those hours, but for the stay at home order, then they can use EPSL for that. So let me give you an example. Um, let's say there is a county that's on super duper lockdown, and your business is in the next county over. If you've got an employee who lives in the super duper lockdown county, um, but you're open and have work for them to do, but according to their, their county's orders, they can't leave their home because they're not an essential worker or whatever, um, then they could use EPSL because you have hours available for them. Uh, likewise, let's say you're open, but the county has an order specific to people who are over 65 that says do not leave your home under any circumstances. Um, they, they work and live in the same county, your business is open, they're going to say, I can't come in uh, because I am over 65 and there's a very specific order for me, so I can't do the hours even though you have them available. That person can use EPSL. We can't use EPSL if there aren't hours available. So if your business has furloughed people or you have reduced hours or you have closed entirely because you're in a county like mine that is still totally shut down. Uh, we can't use EPSL for that. Um, so if there aren't hours available, if the business isn't open and operating with hours available for the employee, uh, then EPSL does not apply. So if you're furloughed, if you're closed down, we're not looking at EPSL. All right. Hey, thank you. Hey, Kara. Oh, yeah. I, I wanted to mention one thing. I've seen a few questions come in on the chat on, uh, you know, Kara mentioned the HR Support Center. I've seen a few questions on where do we access that? How do we access that? Um, if you could reach out to the HCM payroll or HR provider that referred you to this webinar, if you look at the initial invitation, uh, and they will be able to point you in the right direction on how to access the HR Support Center that Kara mentioned. All right. Yes, that is it. And I, <laughs> I am done now. Uh, thank you for joining <laughs> us today. I hope this was helpful. One more reminder, we'd love if you would take that survey for us. Uh, have a great rest of the week.